this is actually a triple act. There's only two of us here, but Gavin Quigan is very much present. He can't join us in person, but he has um, been kind enough to contribute the customary and very useful and insightful breakdown of statistics for the sector, which I'm sure you'll all find very interesting. I do. I find it really valuable. Um, so this presentation is in three parts. I'm going to channel Gavin for about five minutes and talk to a few of those stats. Secondly, you've heard a great deal over the last day and a half about value for money, Kofi, uh, climate related disclosures and, and green investments generally. What I'm going to try to do really at high level is just distill that into um, my take, I guess, of some learnings for restricted scheme trustees on all of those, um, all of those various issues, um, particularly where there are running themes. Then I'm going to do the brief uh, potpourri component, um, you know, brief, brief canter through a couple of other recent developments. The second half is dedicated to Alistair talking to you about vulnerable customers and recent learnings. Uh, both here and from overseas in that context. So without further ado, I'll crack into, this is Gavin's overview of the superannuation schemes market this year, 2022, the transitioned and continuing schemes um, since the FMCA transition. Really quite interesting. It's essentially all of the registered workplace savings and super schemes, i.e. it's the non-KiwiSaver retirement schemes market, both restricted and retail. Assets and membership are based on the latest available annual reports on Disclose and therefore they include annual report numbers from June 2021 onwards. <coughs> the full extent though of the recent market downturn isn't of course accounted for quite yet. At 89 the number of restricted workplace savings and super schemes has reduced by just four from last year's 93 all four who have departed were small defined benefit schemes. There was one FMA approved transfer from one DB scheme to another, so a section 181 transfer. All the pensioners and assets transferred across, so essentially a merger as opposed to a wind up. The other three were wind ups where either the, the relevant trustee provision allowed the trustees to write checks to pensioners, and there are a few of those, or uh, it was a small enough pensioner group for the trustees to elicit 100% pensioner consent to a full cash out offer, enabling a nil wind up. So looking at master trusts with supervisors, um, those workplace schemes, whilst assets are up year on year, total membership numbers do continue declining. We think that's likely to be smaller employer plans ceasing and perhaps some COVID-19 retrenchments as well. But there were 864 employer groups participating in master trusts, restricted and non-restricted, as at 31 March this year, which is not a bad number. Non-restricted legacy schemes, that those are of course the closed retail super schemes. As you'd expect, membership and assets continue diminishing as uh, members withdraw retirement lump sums. The retail super schemes that are on market, all but two of those 12 focus of course on QROPs and most contributing members are in fact in the other two schemes run by Mass and Booster. That segment actually also continues growing albeit slightly. Looking at the total schemes line, the bottom line, overall membership has held up pretty well. Although of course the slowly sinking lid dynamic inexorably rolls on in this mostly legacy sector. At 249,389, membership is down about 5% on last year's 263,000. So turning now to restricted schemes, this is all of them. Restricted workplace saving schemes are down from 87 to 83, given those four small DB scheme wind-ups that I mentioned. Assets were also up slightly. Membership was down by just under 2,000, but that included 748 fewer pensioners, which will be due to wind-up payments, elective cash-outs and deaths. Also noting that the NPF schemes make up almost two-thirds of that pensioners number there with just under 9,000, so there really are very few remaining pensions in payment. The middle row there is all the standalone schemes. Um, 
it strips out the three master trusts, but it does include NPF. Now, most of the money, as you can see, is in the large DC schemes, the bigger end of town in, in, in these terms. Restricted legacy schemes, while assets are ostensibly increased year on year, we think that's probably an aberration due to two schemes having had June 2021 uh, balance dates when the markets were at a relative high. Membership continues trending down. Restricted KiwiSaver schemes, there's only four of them, but they're worth north of half a billion. They saw a slight increase in both memberships and assets. Third of three slides from Gavin. These are the standalone workplace saving schemes, those that are employer centric. There are still 17 schemes in the over 100 million category, and as you'd expect, the majority of the asset and membership growth occurs here. There was net membership growth of 806 members for this category last year. Very long tail though as ever, scrolling down the smallest 33 schemes between them now have fewer than 2,000 members in aggregate, close to half of them pensioners. So my take on this is that overall the restricted schemes market remains strikingly resilient. With assets, incoming contributions and membership all up year on year, and I've got last year's stats if anyone's interested. We're all familiar, of course, with the trapped DB schemes phenomenon, but even amongst the account-based defined contribution schemes and sections, there were no wind-ups, and even more significantly, zero bulk transfers from those schemes into master trusts. And I think a contributor to this is pragmatic regulation, and the mantra that you know master trusts are cheaper are proving in some real life cases to be more rhetorical than real. So um, happy to take questions on Gavin's stats, given that we're a relatively small group. First slide, First slide yep. Would you perhaps be able to share these slides with the FSC so they could be provided to those in the room? Or? Certainly, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get them to you straight on the hard on the heels of this uh, discussion, Carissa, thank you. Cool, well I'll kick on if there's no questions. Oh, Bruce. Um, just in Wait. terms of the... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Um, just in terms of the um, legacy defined benefit schemes. Yes. What would... In the employer space? What would be required to mount a case for the FMA to propose one vehicle to hold everything and not have 17 boards and 17 sponsors or whatever the num number might be to manage the way forward for the future. Yeah, we, um, I'm quite attracted to that idea as well and I think that um, it's an idea um, that uh, merits exploring. We've explored it in some recent contexts. There are a few impediments. One of them is that we would need to use an existing, as the law stands, we'd need to use an existing DB scheme, because the whole sector's been legacied, right, to act for that warehousing purpose. And then we'd have to get our heads around whether it's possible, legislatively, and it likely isn't, to um, impose an accounting ring fence between each uh, constituent plan sitting within that warehouse master trust. So it's, it's, quite, a, um, it's, it's quite an adventurous proposal. Um, it would need some enabling legislation. I agree with you though that um, schemes with an asset base um, barely larger than a high net worth individual's bank account, uh, we, we know this, they have no business existing. So. Um, I'm up for those conversations, but you know, having looked at it, we would need to bear in mind that we would need, um, we're really going to need enabling legislation if there's to be a bespoke product um, uh, solution made available for that purpose. David. Um, kicking on with that theme um, we have talked about from the Workplace Savings Committee of the little war chest of funds left over from yes. um, 
some 229,000. In terms of whether that might be some of those funds could usefully, usefully be invested in exploring that sort of option in terms of actually delivering value for a core group of the traditional as Swans Workplace Savings membership to actually solve, because this is an insoluble problem sitting there that's it's been there for a while, yeah. and it will need some sort of legislative regulatory solution, Yes, and whether actually that would be a good investment of some of those funds I to couldn't agree more. engage someone to actually just explore, is this going to be possible, and push it through, because this is just, it is, as Bruce has pointed out, a an unfortunate drain on the resources of you know a cohort of trustees who are doing the best thing they can in an increasingly challenging regulatory environment for very little value because they're unable to deliver much value for the membership it's there it's stuck it's legacy it would seem to be quite a, a useful solution that as a sector we could combine together to try and develop a solution that will yeah save everyone a lot of time long term I agree, and I gather Australia has um, solved that, solved for that issue, so that that would assist us as well. And there's a precedent for splashing a bit of cash from um, workplace savings reserves. Bruce wasn't there. There was the year where we we barely broke even because we spent thirteen thousand dollars of reserves on getting the, of course, invaluable prospectus exemption. So I really like that suggestion, and I was really hoping. I knew there'd be. A few stalwarts here. I was hoping this would be an exchange of ideas, and I love that idea. So, as context, <laughs> as context, when workplace savings merged into FSC, we, as all of you know, we had a residual reserves that were trivial when distributed pro rata to 83 remaining members or, or given to charity, but actually um, give us options as a as a sitting line item. And pursuant to the merger agreement in um, in the FSC financials, so thanks for that. I'll crack on. Um, as you're all aware, and I won't reiterate what's in it because most of you will have read the newsletter on these exemptions and taken advice. So really, just a few exceptions-based comments from me. On 9 August, effective 31 August, um, FMA granted a range of new exemptions for restricted schemes in the FMC Restricted Schemes Disclosure and Reporting Exemption Notice 2022. The first one was the fund updates relief for DB schemes with those members, those who have members who remain exposed or who are exposed to year-on-year -year investment uh, returns generated by the fund, either because they've yet to arrive at the magic age where they will qualify as of right when they leave service for a salary-based benefit, and therefore they're still accruing a benefit based on contributions plus or indeed minus investment returns, and or they've got a voluntary account which, um, which is exposed to market returns. So... Um, just the thing to call out there is it's, it's a good exemption, it's, it's good relief. Um, complying with it necessitates including in the next year's annual report uh, a statement that the exemption is being invoked, advice as to the scheme's net investment return for the year, and a pie graph or table just showing the target asset mix, so performing some of that functionality of a fund update. So don't overlook those going forward because it is an, it is an exemption condition. With the quarterly reporting exemptions, two, uh, I suppose three key points to note are that firstly, um, uh, as with quarterly reports now, the year-end report need not uh, repeat any information already supplied as long as it's still correct. Secondly, concerning limit breaks, when reports are required, they must still be detailed in the same way as currently, and there remains an obligation to report as soon as practicable any uh, in, in real time effectively, any uncorrected limit break, which means of course one that's not corrected within five days, five working days after the trustee finds out about it. And thirdly, trustees must of course still do their quarter end due diligence so as to reliably conclude that they've nothing to report. Two key points read the member statements exemption and, and here and elsewhere I'm just going to let the slides speak for themselves and just call out a few points. First, it's less an exemption than really an acknowledgement that the standard content requirements in the FMCR were never really fit for purpose. They spoke of contribution inputs and opening and closing account balances, which was just the wrong concepts. Secondly, what's required is really quite simple. 
so for most schemes with active members it's just the year end re uh, retirement benefit um, payable had the member retired on the balance date and for a pensioner the, the aggregate pension amount paid plus the entitlement per payment period be it fortnightly or monthly or some other period but importantly those are just minimums and trustees can add more as they see fit you just uh, saw and I saw most of a reasonably sporty exchange on FMA's value for money initiatives in the other room um, as was noted, uh, KiwiSaver schemes and additionally complying super funds have statutory duties to ensure that fees are not unreasonable. But just as importantly, um, the guidance is of moment to trustee boards in this sector. The strategic purpose of the guidance is to engender an ongoing habit, a discipline of just assessing value, at least annually, with an outcomes focus and a concrete underlying fund manager facing inquiry, for example, might be, are any performance fee fees calculable based on an appropriate return benchmark? And how does the underlying manager substantiate their appropriateness? Some other practical points to consider, if you're a DC scheme or a hybrid scheme with a significant cash accumulation section, is, is the scheme or the section still capable of operating cost efficiently? in terms of services and value, given the significant fixed cost component which we're all familiar with, or is it now just objectively too small to be cost efficient? If no, then in my view there's a fiduciary duty to at least consider cyclically future state options, such as a bulk transfer into a master trust platform of course, or indeed winding up with advice facilitated ongoing retirement provision through KiwiSaver. You should also review your service providers cyclically, admin, legal, actuarial and audit for example. Though you need them, and this is really important, you need them of course to be profitable and therefore prepared to stay in the game. Um, you should be asking yourselves and them, do they continue delivering and do they evince an awareness of the need for value for money and to right size their service provision? Are there certain service lines or member options that just don't pass a cost efficiency sniff test? Perhaps because so few members use them and yet they're paid for by all. Equally, are there areas in which you could sensibly ask, say, the admin manager to do more at modest additional cost, such as improving scheme website functionality? Remember, value for money for this group is about the optimal blend of services and value, not just reflexively cheapest is best. Green shoots are everywhere and they give us lots of learnings. Oh, forgive me. Mike, I have a question on value for money. Yes. In terms of service for providers, does that include auditors? In my view, yes. Yeah. This, you may have Hobson's choice, and I know that some of them are voting with their feet. All, what I, all I can say is almost all of my schemes have received 5 to 10% increases, if not more. And for one that is now a simple scheme with which we have a common interest, it still went up 10%. Unbelievable. That's actually on Gavin's radar. Good. Yeah. But in principle, yes, they're part of that they're part of that discussion. Because we're seeing a trend um, of schemes moving away from the tier one audit firms down to the tier two. Yeah. So that comes back to the point you just made before that it's germane, gonna, isn't it? Yeah. There aren't going to be enough schemes using tier one audit firms for them to be interested in anymore, or they'll be increasing their fees even more. Yeah. So yeah. that's good that Gavin's into yeah. it. So, turning to green initiatives. So, new climate rate related disclosures or CRD regime has begun. You better watch my time. Yep, I'll be fast. Um, an overview terms that binds the large uh, publicly listed companies, insurers, banks, non bank deposit takers, and retail scheme managers with, with over a billion managed. From April 2024, in respect of 2023, they must make annual disclosures about their governance arrangements, risk management strategies, metrics and targets for mitigating and adapting to climate change impacts, including a climate statement conforming to an accounting standard which remains under review, 
that discloses information about the effects of climate change on the business or the fund, and making that climate statement available to the public, which means all of you. Restricted schemes are exempt, but useful benchmarks and learnings will no doubt emerge down the road. In its July 2022 report, Integrated Financial Products Review of Managed Fund Documentation, the FMA published its findings from a review of the effectiveness of disclosures produced by a sample of funds that were labelled variously um, sustainable, ethical or green. Integrated Financial Product is FMA's uh, uh, label of choice, rather, rather clunky, in preference to ESG, but to, in fairness to FMA, the components of the ESG acronym don't have commonly shared meanings. Areas where improvement is needed, say FMA, include explaining exclusions, explaining how investments are selected for inclusion, being clearer about risk and return trade-offs, and disclosing how performance is measured, and what happens when selection criteria are no longer met. The importance, to my mind, highlights the importance of you guys as trustees looking past fund manager rhetoric to go under the hood, so to speak, and test for truth to label. Trustees have legal duties to firstly do their homework regarding what's asserted by their fund managers, and secondly, by so doing, ensure as far as practicable and be able to demonstrate that whatever they disclose to their members about ESG investing is both true and factually substantiated. And just very quickly, um, a new investor stewardship code aiming to improve engagement between investors and the companies they own and promote greater transparency about that engagement launches next week here in Auckland, 30th of September, at the RIAA annual conference. Now codes like this are common internationally and their core concept, and we've heard a little bit about this at the conference, is that investing responsibly is more than just the old orthodoxy of divesting from companies due to ESG concerns and can properly involve staying invested, thereby retaining a shareholder voice to push for change. The code will have nine principles which encourage investors to integrate ESG matters into their investment decision making and require them to design and implement policies to guide engagement vote responsibly and disclose the nature and outcomes of their engagement and be able to explain their engagement to wholesale and their voting to wholesale clients such as restricted scheme trustees not forensically necessary but just necessarily but just by way of giving an overall picture of their voting and stewardship policies so ask your fund managers whether and when they'll sign up to this code and how and how often they'll report on their engagement and their voting. Just quickly on Kofi, and in a nutshell, relevantly for restricted schemes, the Kofi regime is a series of amendments to the FMCA, enacted 29 June, which introduce a fair conduct and licensing regime for financial institutions, principally by requiring them to implement a fair conduct program, and the, re the regime's likely to commence in 2025. Like the climate-related disclosures regime, Kofi doesn't apply to restricted schemes, or indeed to all retail managed investment schemes either. It applies to registered banks, licensed insurers, and licensed non-bank deposit takers who are in the consumer lending business, provide insurance, or specified retail financial services. This fair conduct principle requires financial institutions to treat customers fairly and I won't rattle off what I've talked to you all about, the components of acting fairly, but as part of complying with that fair conduct principle, each financial institution must establish, implement and maintain an effective fair conduct programme embedded in its internal policies, processes, systems and controls. And certain minimum standards are required, and these include, for example, ensuring that all the employees and agents follow the procedures necessary or desirable to support compliance with that fair conduct principle, in your context that's your admin manager particularly, and communicating with customers about the institution's relevant services or associated products in a timely, clear, concise and effective manner. I see I've bounced ahead to decumulation. So turning now to decumulation. This is the spending and retirement phase of retirement planning 
And some noteworthy recent and pending uh, developments have popped up in this space. In its de-jargoning money glossary, um, out for consultation by 30 September, and intended to help the industry embed consistent plain language in all communications, the Retirement Commission recommends using the, words draw, the word drawdowns here for clarity. Steve and his colleagues' research shows that about 50% of KiwiSaver members now continue holding balances after 65. And retention facilities are of course common in DC and hybrid work sa workplace saving schemes too. A July 2022 Society of Actuaries report noting the overall modesty though of, of older members' account balances backs the use of simple, readily available and generalised guidance on investment mix and drawdown options for new retirees. Similarly, Melville Jessup Weaver recommends that all KiwiSaver providers should be required to contact members at milestones approaching retirement, say 55, 64 and 65, to give them general information and guidance on their options. And we now have at least two larger restricted schemes which allow retentions and have produced for their members a decumulation guide to help them with deciding whether to defer, determining life expectancy and deciding how to invest post-retirement and how much to regularly draw down. And of course retail schemes, KiwiSaver schemes have been required since 2020 to include in their annual member statements retirement savings and income projections and prompts for members to think about their fund choice and contribution rate. A few workplace saving schemes give access to, to similar information, although most don't. So the relevant restricted schemes are going to need to start engaging here somewhat more actively, but let's keep it simple. Thanks. Just on the um, annual member statement decumulation stuff in yeah. Kiwi Saver schemes at the moment, do you know if there's any um, any plans to change the um, assumptions that are in those formulas to determine the um, money you can draw down from your projected balance? You know, the 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%? Good question. I, I, That's a good question. I'm not aware of any. I don't know whether it's the other Because it's causing some significant There's a structural defect, but it's another one. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's causing a few hassles in some of our trustees. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, they've got to be standardised in principle. Uh, yes, but also relevant. Yeah. No, not okay. aware of any proposals. Um, so we're, we're working up, the, if the committee is working up some great high-level guidance on drawdowns that trustee boards whose schemes offer retentions can make available to members. And it's going to draw members' attention to such things as the availability and the features of the sorted calculators, and the Society of Actuaries rules of thumb developed to determine you know, what level of sustainable after-tax spending a person's retirement savings might support. I'd better gloss over the privacy stuff. Um, I think <laughs> a couple of points here. Application forms do um, invariably do comply with the legal duty to um, advise the purposes for which uh, and, and you know, personal information is collected, held and used and to whom you can disclose it and rights to access it and request corrections. But in a DB scheme setting, uh, you really should look to do the same with annual pension continuance letters, um, which typically do seek um, updates to addresses and other personal information. Lastly, it's not mandatory, but we're seeing some really good, um, good practice examples in this sector of having at least a simple privacy statement and a privacy policy incorporating breach procedures and you should look at including that privacy statement in an annual report. My last slide here, I'll let those again speak for themselves, but the scrapping on 31 August of the proposal made on 30 August uh, whereby our management services supplied to retirement schemes including KiwiSaver uh, should be subject to the full GST. Um, means that those services remain exempt in supplies, but it does follow that we still need to work through and come to a definitive landing on the pre-existing boundary issue regarding um, the provision of trustee director services to restricted schemes by LITs and other professional trustees. So the committee continues its work on reliably clarifying the GST treatment of uh, those fees. IR informally agrees with us 
that they should be treated as GST exempt, but more formal confirmation will likely take some time and some work to obtain. I'll turn over to Alistair. Thanks, everyone. Well, vulnerable customers' policy is um, becoming sort of hot topic around trustees, trustee meeting tables recently, and so we thought it was worthwhile just having a segment today um, to just talk about vulnerable customers. The intention is that this section will be formed part of one of our training modules, so, so that will go into our library bank um, to be used for, for trustee training. Um, and they also the intention is post-conference to come up with guidance notes for, for a, um, a framework that could be used by trustees as well. It's also very fortunate that we've got um, Philippa and Steve here today because most of what I'm going to say is probably directly uh, <laughs> speaking to them rather than the trustees because trustees will be relying on their administration manager or the administration resources to actually do what I'm going to tell them to do now. So the starting point is um, you know, who needs a, a vulnerable customer policy. So it's a very, very broad definition. So it's anyone who provides um, financial services. And so this squarely includes workplace saving schemes and restricted schemes. So there's no doubt about that. So the FMA's expectation is that there will be appropriate policies and procedures that are, that are embedded throughout the whole membership journey. So who is a vulnerable customer? It's a difficult question. Um, but the FMA has taken guidance from the UK, their definition, um, is, and they're going to be using that in the New Zealand context. So it's someone who, due to their personal circumstances, is especially susceptible to detriment, particularly when a trustee or its agents or third party agents is not acting with appropriate levels of care. And it's important to remember that it's primarily determined by circumstances rather than being specific to any type of person. So how do we go about identifying vulnerable customers? Well, there's a non, there's a, there's a non exhaustive list um, because it can get you know, quite complicated. And sometimes it's not obvious what vulnerability is or what people are suffering as far as vulnerability. But things like income and debt levels are, are clear drivers, uh, financial capability and understanding, life events, health issues, disability, language and literacy, uh, and mental health, they also play a role. And some of these are permanent, but others are fluid. Some are temporary or occur at intervals. So these needs to be taken into account because they, it's, it's, it's can be different. There are considered to be four main categories, uh, health and physical factors, uh, life events, resilience and capability. They're the four sort of headings. It's, it's, I find it's sort of helpful to think of those, those headings when thinking of the, the detail which comes underneath them. And we're talking about life events, we could add to that list redundancy, restructuring the workforce uh, for capability, language difficulties, um, education, uh, and another health and physical factors, I think age s sits there as well, um, and particularly now with retention members, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. I think what's important to realise, and this is a difference that this sector has compared to the, sort of the retail sector, is that there are a number of different contact points for a workplace saving scheme or restricted scheme. What I mean by that is um, you have around the trustee table member representatives, employer representatives, possibly union representatives. There is also an interface with, with the employer through the HR department, etc., or there could be union people on the ground. So there, are, there is a lot of information around, I suppose, the stakeholder group for a workplace savings scheme, which is different than a normal KiwiSaver scheme. And I think that's important when coming up with a policy, so to use all those contact points and have a coordinated approach to the development of a appropriate policy. Because I think all those parties have a role to play. It's important they all understand what a vulnerable customer is and they feed in to the administration manager a central point 
information which can be used for the trustees to determine whether there is a need. Over time, and I think that helps to sort of understand the nature of the membership. And I look at some of the schemes that I look after, and, 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 and um, th three of them, like police, fire, and defence. You're dealing with emergency situations, you're dealing with stressful situations, um, and you think of things like the counter earthquake, um, there are deaths. And I think all those sort of things, if, if you look at your scheme and, and the nature of the sort of things that, that, that could happen, um, will form the basis, I think, of a, a, a made-to-measure policy which suits the makeup of that particular scheme um, and, and the makeup of the membership. And I think the challenge for administration managers is probably coming up with, with a policy to apply across the board and how to customise that for the particular schemes. It's also important, I think, for... Um, sure. So my question is yeah. about privacy. Yeah. So given that around the table, yeah. often a number of those people know the scheme members. Yeah. Um, the admin report, so as a trustee, the admin report tells me if there's been any complaints, mm. if there's been any queries, mm. but the, the identity of the query has a number, not a name, mm. for privacy. Mm. So what I'm just trying to reconcile is how do we know this when it's all got to be private or where does the line blur? Yeah, and privacy, privacy, is, a, privacy is a big factor in all this um, um, because you know, the privacy principles do come into play and so there is a need for consent. Um, uh, and how do, you get, how do you get that consent? It's it's a it's a it's a difficult line, it's a difficult line to walk. Because mm. I had one where yeah. one of the trustees actually became ill with MND, mm. and he ended up a statistic and subsequently died. Yeah. But but he became most of those actually. Yeah. And even though there was no name, you still knew exactly who it was because it was a small point. Or a small um, number of members. Yes, yeah, so. thank you. Yeah, um, I've previously been involved in a medical type um, um, benefit scheme, and one of the way we dealt with that was having one of the trustees would be the, the counterpoint to deal with that particular mm. person and wouldn't share the details of who it was, so yeah. one knew who it was. And they would report back anonymously to the rest of the of the trustees. I think delegated to your administrator. Yeah, I think I I I I still this quite pragmatically in a in a way. Um, you can let privacy get in the way of what's the right thing, um, and doing it in a way which is um, compassionate. Um, there will be people that know. Um, and a lot of this is common knowledge too in a way, it's, just no, it's known by a, a, you know, it might be a small community or family community and sort of just making contact in a, in, in a, in a compassionate, caring sort of way. I was going to say exactly that, I mean, um, almost as a function of that dynamic, everyone knows who you're talking about, yeah. you shouldn't let um, privacy get in the way of doing objectively the right thing yeah. for that person, yeah, yeah. treating them as appropriate. Yeah, yeah that's my Hmm. It's a few years ago. Yeah, but I think that that's the right, and it just work, what is appropriate, and and it is a it is an individual thing too, because the people know the individual, um, and, and what is, the, is is it a family? Is it is it friend, is it a friendship? To, how to deal with that person? Um, but just doing the right thing, I think, is the important thing. I was going to talk about d data. So collecting, collecting, and, and, you, and you just talk about that is, is I think it's I think it's important to collect to collect data, which is obtained in a in a, in a way. So if someone complains, if someone um, is making inquiries, um, uh, making sure that that's that sort of captured. You can you develop a database which can be used later on over over a period of time. 
uh, it might relate to a particular workplace situation. Uh, you know, who knows? So how do we address it? Um, the first thing that need to be, a, you know, a, a, appropriate support services to deal with a particular vulnerable member or the circumstances. That can be done internally. Um, and probably interested, Philip or Steve, as to what you thought about uh, about this as far as, say, escalation is concerned. Um, it can be done internally or third party providers. There may be diff different services used for different events, um, depending on what is, what is appropriate. Um, but it is important that th there is a process to deal with with vulnerability. So if a vulnerability is um, is determined, there is appropriate action taken, there's escalation when necessary, and so you have a process which deals with um, what will eventuate. I, I won't go through this, but there's a list of um, ways to, 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 uh, to deal with this. Um, any of these would work, it's what's, what's appropriate. And this will link in, particularly to the administration manager, what their processes and systems are. Mm. So I think part of the part of this is for trustees to understand and engage with the administration managers as to what what they're doing and what they're proposing, mm -hmm. so they're aware of it themselves, because they need to understand the process that is going to be applying for their for their membership and their schemes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. FMA provided a few examples. Um, of, of uh, good practice. These aren't necessarily related to workplace saving schemes, but um, it was talked about, in fact, Mike talked about before about um, uh, calling all customers sort of about 65 or different points in time. Uh, and, uh, this, was, this was one calling all customers aged 70 plus to identify hardship issues. This was done, this was done by a bank. So, uh, so we've got to add accounting service as well as administration service. <laughs> what do you mean by that, Steve? Ring them up and ask them how they're feeling today. We know you, you, it doesn't 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 need to be ring them, but but I think we talked about it before. It's appropriate at probably aged at a certain age. It could be sixty five to talk about as they for retention members in particular that are keeping money in the scheme, um, starting to engage with them about what is appropriate for their circumstances, what 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 their aims and aspirations are. Um, so a lot of schemes now have got deferred membership or, or, or retention members. Um, it, it's, it, it, is a, it is a growing trend, which is good. There's no, no, nothing wrong with it, but it does, doesn't uh, lead to different responsibilities. Um, and particularly if you talk about vulnerability, as they get older, um, their health might deteriorate, dementia might come in, um, uh, is it the right investment option that they've chosen? So I think those sort of things come into, um, into play as far as um, retention to food membership is concerned. Uh, the second one I've got there is, you know, contacting customer segments, new members to make sure that they are aware of, because um, sometimes there is a lack of knowledge about the scheme. Um, uh, just making sure that they understand is another example. Um, ones with larger balances, um, maybe contacting them, that's another, another example of what could be done. Um, hardship relief, we've talked a lot about that, that today. Um, that is again, we talked about that this morning in, um, in, in the, uh, C the CEO session for um, uh, the, the Trustee Companies Association, and, and you know, the, the Kiwis have a hardship applications. And you couldn't help thinking about vulnerability there as far as how to deal with those hardship applications and the difficulty. I didn't realise that 22,000 applications for hardship last year. I found that I found that staggering, um, and the time it takes to process those for people who are in a difficult, you know, in a difficult state. Because, um, but the the form and the process that you need to need to go through um, is just it's sort of intolerable. It's not it's not really consumer friendly at all. Um, but that that is sort of what it is. Now we're not faced with that statutory requirement as far as the forms, the information. But dealing with hardship claims needs to be done compassionately, often it needs to be done urgently, um, and understanding their circumstances. The switching funds, we've, you know, that was of an event through, 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 um, through COVID. Um, 
you know, what happened. Look, look, it'd be good to look back and see what process did you follow when people were looking at switching from from um, you know, from growth to conservative. Making sure that do you believe that what you did at that time was appropriate um, when people did switch? Then there's examples. I think of probably people felt threatened and felt worried and so made a decision. Was it the right decision? Could more have been done at that time for those uh, people? Because I think they were probably vulnerable at that time, not knowing what to do and panicking. But if you followed up on those people who did that post seeing the transfer, yeah. it's a very fine line um, between contacting them because you think they are vulnerable yeah. versus financial advice. Yeah. All you can all you can do is just make them where well, you can't give individual advice, but you can actually let them pause. We just have to pay our administrators more to do that. <laughs> yes, I was going to say um, the same thing. There's quite a crossover yeah. of, like, into. Sorry. <laughs> There's quite a crossover into, you know, the balance of financial advice, trustee responsibility, communication with members, and also personal responsibility. Even though, um, you know, there is, you know, it's essential that we take into consideration customer vulnerability, but it, it really is a joint venture. And um, yeah, the overlaps, and particularly getting into financial advice, um, you need to be very careful not to sort of sway people in a direction unintentionally yeah. just by having some of those conversations. Um, yeah, so I, I'm sort of with Steve a little bit too. We need to also be careful that we're not becoming counsellors um, because we don't have those skills <laughs> um, as well. Yes, it's, 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 it's a challenge, and, and I'm, I'm being a bit provocative here just to get to get your thinking, but you know, you, you could say, well, there may be situations where counselling is needed, and that's not you, but it is a, it's a third party provider that, that, that does that. Yeah, it's probably the process of identifying yeah. these people first, right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. all you are, at the, you're, you're at the front line, and so you're identifying, gosh, we've got a problem here, how do we handle it, and just having a process to, to take the appropriate path to handle it properly. The next one, staff training. Um, you know, clearly all this is new, and and and, and I imagine um, you know administration managers are going through a training exercise for the for the for the frontline staff in particular about how to identify it. I won't go through through, through everything on here apart from identify the word emphasize should be empathize, <laughs> empathize not not emphasize. Um, um, but it, but but again. It's important your staff training. It's important that, that the trustees are also given some training with this. Um, so again, I think as far as trustee meetings are concerned, th th there should be a section dealing with that training in, 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 the, in the you know in the ne next while. Um, uh, but also uh, the process. Uh, trustees understand the process, and also internal training to make sure there is a, a robust process, and everyone in the staff knows that process. Next one is, 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 is design, um, and I look at this in a way that if, if you're looking at looking at adding benefits or doing or restructuring, adding more investment choice, um, what FMA's, FMA's expectations are that before you do those sort of things, you actually think about customer vulnerability. Um, um, so if you're adding more investment options or, or, or more benefits, have you thought about what the impact might be? Um, I just put up there what FMA um, is views on these things. Obviously, there, there um, this is focused on banks and, and, and the whole financial service industry. But if you're applying it to, to to this sector, that's where I think it comes in as to giving some thought to to rolling it out. And there's a comms exercise, making sure people understand what the changes are, um, and and and. Um, if there is needed for, for help and assistance, that's available so that people do understand. Reviews, is, ongoing reviews is also important. Um, this is a new journey. Um, 
there were new policies and processes that they should be reviewed and validated at a regular regular period. Um, there should be responsibility internally, and I imagine both M MJW and Mercer have got have got that um, sort of ownership within the organisation. Um, that is important, uh, and um, that should be reported back to trustees. I wanted to talk about um, insured benefits too. Um, Sorry, just, uh, sure. Just um, just going back, just thinking, because I'm relatively new to this, yeah. um, but, you know, we've talked about two parties, so that'll be the trustees, the administrators. Yeah. I can think of a third party, which will be the the firms themselves, if yeah. they're restricted. So yeah. that opens a whole Pandora's box in terms of if it's a larger organisation and multi, um, you know, with multi-locations yeah. and things like that. Does that mean the trustees have really got to sort of do a training scheme throughout the organisation? Because, I mean, the trustees may never know that there's been a contact between, uh, sort of, your member and, and, say, their local HR people, unless they've been told, I suppose. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's worth talking about. Where I'm at with this is, is possibly, um, let's say, HR knowing that there is a vulnerable customer policy because they are the ones that the administration made, that they're the ones that you deal with. Um, and so that they are, know what that policy is, know how it works. If they're aware of something, they know who to, who to contact. Um, so so there, is a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a dialogue, um, a clear line of communication that, that HR can have to, uh, to the administration manager. Yeah. Yeah, it gets a bit complicated. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. I mean, as a firm, you may have a, a service that pr provides that um, anonymously, which a lot of us mm. do, and they will, the, the staff member will then go to that organisation and they will get a whole lot of services at no cost and anonymously, and all the organisation gets back is a reporting on how many people use the service. So mm. you won't often know there's an issue, um, is the trouble I think that's one of the key issues there from a the employer's point of view yeah I think it's also important to, to, to bear in mind that it, it, this all links to what the trustees functions and duties are and 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 that links to it's providing retirement benefits and ancillary benefits to members, and so so that the duties relate to, to to retirement benefits. They don't relate to to health per se. Um, it's it's how that impacts on them making good decisions regarding the benefits. And so, this is all in a framework of of you being able to satis satisfactory carry out your duties and obligations, which is providing appropriate retirement benefits. So it links back to that. And how these things going on here might impact on on you being able to carry out that duty to the you know, for the for the benefit of of the member. So is this something which could affect their benefit, which means affecting their judgment on decisions they make regarding what sort of benefit they take? Um, that's what we that's what we're talking about. It's fundamentally about their retirement benefit. What about insured benefits? So, uh, particularly TPD, I think it probably, in most situations like TPD or, 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 or a benefit like that, there's probably going to be stress, um, probably anxiety, and so making sure that process, where it's insurance claims process, is done for the benefit of the member and making that, that experience as good as it can be, um, um, and some maybe as quickly as it can be too, um, because they are periods of stress, I think, too, so I think that can't be forgotten about. I just wanted to... Um, we're sort of up on time now, so, so I, I, had a few, I had a few war stories I was going to tell, but I won't, I won't, uh, I won't prolong it. Um, but I hopefully you found that sort of useful and was pro pro provocative as far as getting you to think about, uh, about what your needs are. I know it's sort of difficult, and but trying to keep it within that what your duties and functions are, I think, is is, is important. You should think about it in that light, and looking at um, you know Mercer and MJW and other administration managers to um, 
uh, to come up with appropriate policies for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for attending.